Do you mind if we record this? Nope, don't mind. Excellent. <laughs> All right. So you're the guy behind Beagle Bone. Is that so? Are you? Yeah. You're the founder. Uh, so Gerald and I co-founded BeagleBoard.org. Gerald Coley is the has been the. Um, he started out doing all of our hardware designs. I did with the specs, kind of managed the community, um, did the, um, yeah, the, the community facing side of things. Um, eventually he went on to, um, he, he left uh, TI as his day job and uh -huh. his day job became uh, a consulting business. Yeah. Doing hardware design and so, um, you know, basically, he was going to have to start charging me for doing any of the work, and he's expensive. Mm -hmm. So, so we ended up, um, you know, kind of parting ways a little bit. You know, we still interact, but um, we're the two that started BeagleBoard up, and um, and I've I've stuck with it. Um, so I'm currently president of the board, um, and my my wife is the executive director of the foundation. Nice, yeah. So I, I still have a day job at TI, but my day job is I just they, they just dedicate my time to Beagle. So, uh, that's that's pretty cool. Tell me how uh, what motivated you in the first place to start Beagle Bone, Beagle Board. Uh, so I really wanted to um, to to I, I want to get people tools for developing. Uh, with electronics and, and the same type of stuff that I had when I was a kid, but better, right? I mean, I think of like my my um, growing up, um, you know, when I was, I, I learned to program when I was eight. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom taught me to program. She she brought a, she bought a computer for her business. Um, she ran a business out of the house. She did a, it was a taxes. And, um, you know, I was, um, um, but, you know, at the time, the, the, do you remember the one laptop per child? Yeah. Um, that was a little bit of an inspiration. I think some of the stuff from uh, from work, there was there used to be these DSP starter kits. Mm -hmm. um, but we kind of had a little bit of magic, I thought, with the, at the time, TI was big in the um, this, the cellular phone business. Mm -hmm. And the ARM processors were starting to get to be fast enough to run desktop operating systems on mm -hmm. them. And that we could make, um, you know, something super affordable mm -hmm. um, and super hackable, disposable computer, mm -hmm. right? Where you know, like you wouldn't worry about, you know, what we'd always talk about at the time is like you know, your hard drive. You can't let kids play with computers anymore because all the family photo album, you know, sitting there on the hard drive, right? They mess up the configuration. You know, folks can't log into their work. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I think later was picked up by um, Raspberry Pi, and I think that they've done a really great job at kind of fulfilling um, some of our original uh, mission. Um, but, but one of the things that they really haven't fulfilled is um, that it's not just about, you know, programming cheap computers, that ultimately it's about um, building skills that um, actually you know, translate into individual entrepreneurship, right? So um, actually designing appliances, not applications, right? Not creating things that run on other people's platforms, but actually building um, some electronics um, such that you're no longer a, a slave to technology, but actually empowered by technology. Yeah. And and I think that's the kind of thing that we, we, we tend to um, want to run counter to is um, mm -hmm. it is the idea that I'm going to write write some code or write something for somebody else's platform, or I'm going to create something that works seamlessly into my life and doesn't become an extra distraction. Yeah, um, no, I hear you. I mean, that's life. that's what we do, right? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we do that for tractors and houses. And right, you make them and... work seamlessly for people that just want tractors and houses, not you know computers to program <laughs> yeah 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 and and like actually for the first time like you know lifetime design is a big promise and i'm only beginning to see that it's been like say you know five years that i'm driving the same tractor but the cool thing is you know the other last winter i swapped out the engine the power cube in like an hour or two right so 
in time, you can see, yes, the promise of lifetime design, which to me is one of the central promises of open source, is being realized. And it's hard to see up front because, uh, you know, we, we've been around for a decade. But the value proposition becomes more clear as time goes on for us uh, on the lifetime design aspect. That's, that to us is huge. Like, you've seen my TED talk. I, I haven't actually. Oh. Oh, you got to see that. But, I need to see it. Uh, I need to see it. I should. Have, I should definitely should have done my homework. Here yeah. And done that, but. Uh, okay, so I talk about. I'll, I'll follow up. Okay, you, you got to watch it. Uh, too bad because it's it's good. It's really good. Um, I, I'll leave it at that. Um, the idea was there that the tractor broke down. Uh, I paid to get it repaired, then it broke again, and pretty soon I was broke too, and that's why I built it, that that first one. And yes, that promise is act definitely. Uh, people being in control of their technology. Yes, we're not ser serving it, they're, it's serving us. I'm sorry, you, you cut out your voice. You're, I can't hear you anymore there. Oh, there. No? What happened? Testing one, two, three. Yes, now I can hear. Okay. Uh, no, I, that's uh, that's absolutely... Um, you know, one of my personal motivations, um, you know, I, I easily see us going into a world of, um, I'll call them, um, you know, Gandalfs and Hobbits, mm. right, where a small number of people essentially um, own the knowledge of technology um, and everyone to everyone else is just magic, right? They, they can't even see how things are done, right? Yeah. It's just, it's beyond them. And, um, and I think we could easily have ourselves fall into that that sort of world and i think yeah. it's um, it's it's not the world i want to live in it's not the one i want my child to grow up in um and uh and have for you know the world's future and i think we can fix it absolutely right? um but we need to make an effort to fix it um mm. so i want to be part of the, the the solution in fixing it yeah absolutely uh this brings it up so you're at ti is ti quite open source friendly or e We've done some things um, to um, make a difference in, at the, the corporate level. I'd say that um, as I've gotten more Beagle focused, my overall um, corporate uh, footprint has shrunk. My, mm. my focus has been much more outward and, and really enabling people outside to leverage TI technology and, and bringing some aspects of it out. Um, but we've, we, we have, um, like on our processor side, one of the big changes that we made is that um, all um, well, we, we run Linux for most of our embedded processors for the for the higher end embedded processors, and we we made a change that all software support will be mainline Linux support, not you know killing all of the because um, what it used to be is that we. Um, would have a fork of Linux and we release a BSP and then that's what people had to live on. Um, and the community just had to fend for itself. Um, that was one thing I was instrumental in changing at TI. Um, so we now have a, a mainline first approach. Um, a new SOC will be coming out many, many months ahead of there being a public announcement and, um, and, and ship availability. Uh, there will be patches on the shared to the mainline Linux kernels to support the processors ahead of release. Um, okay, t please explain it a little bit. So, for example, I'm using Ubuntu right now. So, Ubuntu is uh, not the mainline. Well, Ubuntu is a Linux distribution. So, the kernel is just um, essentially sits as largely one package in Ubuntu. Um, so, it's the part that touches the the hardware, right? Mm -hmm. It's the part that knows how to talk to the wireless adapter. It's the part that knows how to talk to the hard drive the keyboard, the monitor, the mouse, all the USB devices. It's the one that handles um, the hardware bits, uh, provides all that abstraction. Um, so for a new processor, right, you have to essentially rewrite portions of the Linux kernel to have it support the peripherals um, and capabilities of the, the hardware. Um, and so we've made sure that um, so, so when Ubuntu builds Ubuntu, mm -hmm. they, they take the Linux kernel from Linux Torvalds, right? So there is the one Linux kernel, mm -hmm. um, which is you know, maintained by Linux Torvalds. 
you know, he handed off control for, for to Greg for Hartman for a, a few months, but um, essentially, he, you know, he, he that that version of Linux is the Linux, so that's what we call mainline. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a process of you know full community review that happens in order to make changes to that that software. Um, so different people own different subsystems that essentially Linux trusts, um, and then they build up patches and ultimately apply patches to like he he accepts those patches into to his version of the software. Um, so there's a very open development model um, for for doing that, and so and that's all on the public mailing list. So anybody can say, I don't like that. You shouldn't do it that way. It's not a good it's not a good style. It's not a good code structure. It's you know. I don't, you know, I don't understand it. It's not clearly documented. Anything, and the person who wrote it in order to get it accepted has to answer those, um, has to be accountable to those questions. Um, and so it's a, um, it's a, it's just a very different. Companies don't generally like to do such things, for for like, oh, so you're saying my deadline is based upon what some kid sitting in a cornfield, you know, with a with an internet access says about, you know, what I should be writing into my code. That doesn't seem very fair, but that is what's fair. And, um, you know, so we have a, um, you know, the Linux kernel has that sort of governance model. Yeah. Um, anybody can complain and say no. Um, and anybody can say, hey, it looks good. But ultimately, um, you know, there has to be some consensus that it's good before it gets applied to the kernel. Um, yes, yes. And anybody, go ahead. So, are you are you saying that you're able to get your uh, your hardware? So, so what's explain like you succeeded getting the developers, your developers? The developers would want to just like okay, I can show to my manager that this code works and demonstrate it, and then let's ship it to a customer, right? And that was just, that was the development process, right? Mm -hmm. They get things working, they prove to their manager that the code works, and they ship it to customers. That's not the development process anymore. Now now the development process is they get it working, they have to submit it to a public mailing list um, for its review to be included in the mainline Linux kernel. Um, And they're not done until that community review uh, cycle and merge merge window actually completes it. So... Um, now that the, I mean, the ultimate selling point back um, into the corporate management is that that greatly reduces the ongoing support churn. Because mm. as soon as your code is, is accepted into the mainline, then if anybody breaks that code or doesn't think it's their responsibility to fix it. Mm. So as there's security fixes that are brought in, mm. uh, as new features are added or all these things, as the code continues to evolve, your code is getting evolved with it, um, mm-hmm. and you're not left behind. Um, so ultimately, like, there's a long-term payoff mm-hmm. for corporations mm-hmm. to be good citizens of oh. our software, um, and that was a that was a, a, a difficult sell, um, but one that's like we've been doing that now for you know over uh, ten years now, and um, right there's now it's like you. Now it's in, it's institutionalized, right? You can't wow. convince them that there's any other way to develop Linux kernel software. Congratulations! For, so you're responsible for that. Yeah, I, I was on the team, uh, so we helped initiate that. Um, I, I, I found some like-minded colleagues. Um, you know, we we went and um, toured a lot of businesses, brought back um, you know intelligence, right? That that, that gave us the, the help us make that case. Um, and, um, you know, we went to folks like, uh, Compaq, I guess, before their HP and IBM and, um, and toured all their open source development, uh, groups, um, Intel, um, and were able to kind of put together the case, um, you know, say that myself and Bill Mills were kind of the, the key parties behind that effort. And the other companies, they were already doing the mainline? They were already doing some, some mainline development work, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so let's let's skip into the Steam camps. That's, I think, an education on how that commit process. I think I can talk about that because I think there's probably some stuff I could we could learn for open source ecology of how to manage a project for real. So I think so. Part of this whole effort of getting the team is to, is to also push that forward. But 
for now so would you actually be interested in running the steam cams do you have the time to do that or that's you think you can help in other ways or of how much um, uh, prep work needs to be done if it's a you know hey show up with my knowledge base and, and answer questions and like work if it's you know, like a couple days commitment you know to go and run a camp um, I can certainly take that on um, if we're talking about developing curriculum um, on anything more than a you know, a, you know an hour a week short sort of basis I, I you know that's going to be that's going to be tough for me. Um, I can, you know, I can probably squeeze half an hour for, that for a week of, of something in. Um, but it's kind of like ongoing development time is really tough for me. Um, certainly problem solving, helping, you know, uh, eliminate some barriers, uh, making connections, those things that can be very easy. Um, curriculum that much, right? We can yeah. certainly contribute some things in our curriculum base um, or places where things overlap, um, but our our teaching base tends to be very heavy on number one Linux and number two embedded electronic. Um, I think it's just hard for us to spend um, much time beyond that. Uh, we have uh, been kind of secondarily involved in some um, both Linux and electronics education around Raspberry Pi, um, but uh, it doesn't, um, it doesn't ultimately, I don't think, serve our goals, right? It's, it's, it's something we can do a little bit on, but um, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's where we bring any, um, anything special to Tell me, uh, t so tell me more about the distinction in practice. How do you see the, you know, working practically with Raspberry Pi versus BeagleBone? Um, the difference that the, so you, you have the blueprints open so that if you went out of business, somebody else could produce it or things like that. Um, in practice, like, what do you, tell me more about what you see the difference between the two. Um, so, um, I'd say that, that our, community um, tends to skew very professional. Um, we have a lot of people who's, who that sourcing and longevity really matters to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have people that um, put our boards up into satellite networks. There's one of them that's their, their claim to fame is, um, is every, um, every square meter, every hour of the earth is photographed by a beagle bone <laughs> of using x-ray um, X-ray cameras in satellites. Um, yeah, in satellites and a commercial satellite network. So um, wow, that's uh, that's built out using using beagle bones. Um, you know the um, hmm. I, 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 I'm, because of all this stuff with the space recently, because of the 50th anniversary, I've got a lot of space projects on my mind. Hmm. Uh, you know, NASA uh, builds. Um, Mars prototype rovers that they've, um, you know, run underneath the Arctic Circle um, with with Beagle Bones. Um, so their attraction is they need full control and open source. They, they they care about it. There's also some hardware capabilities that that tends to make it better for um, more electronics and mechatronics types of applications. Um, we have some microcontrollers inside the SOC that. Um, allow doing hard real-time control. Um, so a lot of a lot of folks. Um, so there's certainly, you know, they're, they're kind of skewing professional more just based on um, robustness. Um, we include onboard flash, um, which is far more reliable than micro SD cards. Um, uh, we, um, I think we've addressed quality and manufacturing issues generally better. Um, than Raspberry Pi, so people choosing to embed it um, can feel more secure that either they can go and source it on their own, they can enter supplier agreements, they can do custom versions. Um, you know, they, they have control hmm. of the supply chain, um, right? They can get full documentation on all the components being used on the board. They just feel more in control, plus they're more capable. 
of doing the hard real-time control things that you would need to do in a like a mechatronics sort of environment. Um, we get used in, like Dremel uses this in their newest laser cutter, the first UL listed laser cutter. Which which one? Which company? Uh, Dremel. Do you know the hand power yeah, tool? Dremel. Yeah, Dremel. Uh, Bosch. Yep. Yep. Yeah, they're owned by Bosch. Okay. okay. Um, so Dremel's, uh, they have a Digilab laser cutter. You, you know, you're familiar, you must be very familiar with laser cutters. Yeah. Um, I don't know the specific brand, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Dremel is new to laser cutters. They're, um, I'm trying to remember who they hmm. bought the design off of. Um, they bought the design off of somebody that's more common in, in laser cutters. But um, it, it, anyway, it's the first UL listed, which is like a safety qualified yep. laser cutter. Um, and they just, they put a beagle bomb inside the product, right? It's actually driving the controls for the, the laser. Hmm. Right, so moving the motors, it, it produces the stepper pulses for the, um, the stepper motors as well as the, um, you know, controls the, the electronics for the, the, the laser strength. Right, so um, that sort of hard real-time controls plus high throughput um, Linux system um, is something that um, you know, machine control in, in general is something we do. Can really you speak well. up a little bit? Uh, <coughs> your sound is getting a little... Yeah, was I covering up the microphone with my hand? At Maybe. That? Yeah. Is it better now? It's better now. Yep. Okay. Um, so machine control type things are something yep. we do really well. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, TI. Um, you know, is, laser saw, right? Yep, yeah, absolutely. They did a. They did a. Um, they had a variant. Like laser saw, you you bought the controller separately. You, you could buy like this base board, but then you could plug in uh, the controller. Laser saw had a BeagleBone option. You talk to Stefan. I did um, at the, uh, I think it was open source hardware, um, I think is where I met Stefan, or no, was it open source hardware, or maybe it been Maker Fair Rome. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but not, we, didn't, we never built a relationship, um, yeah. I just met him. Hmm. So BeagleBone right now is, I mean, it's financial, economically, you're a successful company. Yes, uh, we, we sold 350,000 BeagleBone Blacks last year. Um, we don't, uh, we, we license our logo, um, to manufacturers who pay us a royalty based on, um, board sales. So we get a, um, like we, we really have very little expenses and, um, you know, they pay us a, a, a dollar amount per board sold. So, so we're, we're financially stable, five, a nonprofit corporation. Um, and then they don't have to pay me because I still have my day job at TI. So, and I get all my time dedicated to, to Beagle. So it's really uh, kind of an ideal situation for me. I get to work on my passion um, and still get a, a steady paycheck. Wow. So they're, because it's in their interest, because it's their controllers, your it's, it's their processors that we use. So huh. it's in our interest because it helps build the developer community for their processors. Um, so as long as they keep making me processors that I'm interested in using, um, we're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. What, what's the comparison, for, like, for Raspberry Pi? How many, do you know how many they sell per year? Uh, they're quite a bit larger. They're probably 10 times larger annually. So, yeah, they're, like, in 3, 4 million a year. Hmm. I think they've exceeded about 25 million at this point. I'm not too sure. It might be, like, 25 or 30 million. I think we're a total of about 2 million. Hmm. And in practice, so, so for example, for practical considerations on our project, say we wanted, we, we already said you pointed out to us, okay, Raspberry Pi tablet kind of deal. Um, can we do the same? I'm sure we can, but the question is how much prior art there is in the open source to make it happen? I mean, that's the question we're going to be up against. Or do you know any, any good Raspberry <laughs> BeagleBone tablets that, that exist? Yeah, there, um, so uh, there are. Um, like really good. I mean, the, the easiest thing is to repurpose a Pi tablet, honestly, and that's what I've been doing. Is you just repurpose a Pi tablet? They just. So what do you mean? Sorry. Options. What do you mean? Repurpose a Pi tablet? You can use a, um, some Pi tablets and put beagles inside them. Okay. Okay. So I mean, that's the easiest thing to do. We have some companies start up, um, like a 
there's one company always innovating that had this kind of interesting tablet design where they, they took one of our boards and it, it could be a tablet or you could slide it into a keyboard and it could be a laptop or um, it had three different modes. I don't know. But like there's a lot of people that have done like custom tablets, but you want a continuity of supply, right? That's critical. If you're going to invest educational materials, um, around it, you need a, um, a real continuity of supply. And I, I wouldn't steer you towards any Beagle specific um, laptops. Um, I would just look for someone that's open hardware that's for a Pi that we can just reuse. There's not, you know, if you're talking about the teammates. USB, you know, keyboard, USB touchscreen. Yeah, know. essentially you've got a, a touchscreen. So for example, I've got my I mean, ideal for me, uh, I've got my little cell phone. I'd like to replace that with a tablet that I could also put a phone on. Yeah. That'll be the dream product. Okay. But yeah. the first step is just to replace, like, you know, sometimes in the morning I, I don't go on a computer. I go on a tablet to do some things. I want to get rid of the proprietary stuff that is throwaway. I want to have a lifetime product. So sure. that's yeah. my interest. Sure. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Um, yeah, we... Cause We've had so many of these kind of like different little fringe products. You know, being open hardware, people make different things. Like one of the one of the interesting is the the open moco phones. We actually had people doing open hardware phones based off our design. Off um, the Beagle Bone? Yeah. Um, is there anything that came out to any practical anything that's practical or um, what's the best example? Can you depends, point me to? It depends on what you're um, Something so, that's usable. Uh, so the the thing is is the uh, um, the most of the Beagle bones are Cortex A eights, and then you got the pure use. Um, that felt really fast, um, you know. Uh, you know, seven years ago maybe it feels very slow today. Um, so they're not depending on how much you load it, right? Um, you know, if you're running Android, you're running. Um, you know, other types of, of, of desktops that, you know, with, the, with some tablet interfaces, um, you're not going to be amazed with the, the old BeagleBone Black. The BeagleBone AI, which is our new board, which we're launching next month, um, you know, has a modern, you know, performance to it. Um, but it's, you know, it's just, it's just coming out next month. Mm. Uh, so, um, like I said, where we focus more is on embedded electronics and less than the UI. There's so many cheap tablet chips um, out there that um, uh, you know we're we're um, there's 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 cheaper open hardware solutions. I think like the Olamex stuff. Are you okay. familiar with Olamex? Uh, yeah, heard of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, they have to leverage the. I mean, you understand the economics of, of silicon manufacturing a bit, I, I hope. Um, that you got to produce a lot. A lot. It, yeah. It's very expensive to make the um, um, the, the design, that they, the, you know, the reticles, they say, but like the, the, the blueprint for a piece of silicon is, you know, could be millions of dollars um, to develop. Um, so you have to sell a lot of them, even though individually they may not cost much mm -hmm. you have to sell a lot of them in order to make your money back um so and there's interesting efforts around risk five yep it we should definitely be you you should definitely be paying attention to um that help reduce some of the development costs but ultimately um like the, the what they call tape out or or you know that 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 process of actually making the first chip is very expensive um, you know, there, there are a number of um, mostly Chinese manufacturers that uh, make processors that use in a very high volume in little Android tablets, mm -hmm. some of which you may or may not be confident in the, the long-term supply chain, um, and some of which you may feel reasonably confident that the, um, the software support um, in the mainline Linux kernel is at a good point. Um, but it's very hard to compete with the price. Um, so, like, that's not one area we've really 
that's some, that's a place I've been kind of left out of because there's mm. just not, um, you know, NXP is not really doing anything that really competes there. Um, you know, there's, um, and they do, a, NXP is one of the companies that does good, what I'd say, broad market or catalog processor support, um, like a TI. Um, but, um, but they, nobody has stuff that competes with these cheap Android um, tablet chips. Yeah. Huh. And if you, and like the lifetime design is kind of hard there too because the performance keeps increasing. Right. So, see, see, so, what I'm, so what I'm just trying to boil it down to is you kind of have to set a performance goal. Right? What's the software that you need to run on here really well? And um, let's make sure we can run that software really well. If you want like this continually upgrade to run the latest and greatest software, like the always chasing the latest Android, for example, um, you know, uh, you know, three, four, three years or two, three years from now, you're going to have to redesign it again. And that's probably not something you want to do. Yeah. Do you know anybody who's addressing this? Okay, let's get the, the stable phone. Like, okay, I need a phone that works. I need a web browser that works that I can surf my wiki and add to it. I mean, is there any project that kind of is focusing on a stable, simple version? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Sir. Like the Open Moco phone, I think is 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 pretty nice. Um, the problem is, is what's the market for something like that? Um, you know, there are people certainly focused on 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 stable uh, for phones. I think some of the stuff in the like what used to be the high low tech. Uh, stuff out of the media lab and, and MIT and um, um, and Dave Mellis was working on a, a phone. But, I mean, he was going back to essentially like um, right. like really simple phones that didn't run um, didn't run GUIs at all. It was just a phone, <laughs> just a phone. But like Open Moco, I mean, that's kind of 2013 is the last. Is that's dead or? It's still, we still constantly see Nicholas um, maintaining the patches for it, but it's just, um, it's stable, but I don't know if he's going to, like, what's his plans for doing additional production runs and that sort of thing. It's just, um, and I don't know who else has kind of picked up the, the mantle for that type of uh, development. Okay. There was a nice effort. I got really excited about um, um, a thing called Project Aura. Um, Google picked but that, up and it was doing this. That died, right? Yeah. Yeah. Motorola Z, Motorola Z kind of uses some of the technology, but it's really not the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, that's an area, um, uh, you know, the modular based designs so that you can continue to upgrade the processing but keep the kind of the, the infrastructure so you're not paying, you know. Yeah you know, subsidized through your plan or whatever, $800 every two years for a new phone. Motorola Z has one of those? That's a, they, that's a they leverage some of the They leverage some of the technology. They, they call them Moto Mods. Mm -hmm. um, but you still have to upgrade the base phone. There's not, they don't really take to full heart the concept of um, a replaceable processing unit. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, for the specs of, say, BeagleBone Black compared to Raspberry Pi, the latest, I mean, to do a simple but decent tablet, you know, that you can surf the web on, I mean, that's that can be made pretty fast, but I would imagine the, the lack is the software, the simple software, like the basic stripped-down software. Run down. You can run a, you know, not the latest Android, but you can run a couple of releases of Android ago, and that runs pretty well. It, it just depends on what your what your your goal is, right? I mean, uh, yeah, the complexity of the websites you're visiting. Right? Some of the websites, you know, some modern websites can take a lot of resources. Um, you know, I'd be far more inclined if what you're wanting to do is like have something that does good web browsing. For for us, is to use our our BeagleBone AI, which is the new board. Um, but in general, I mean, I'm not even against you using a Pi. Um, you know. Uh, it's just um, it depends on what you're teaching right if you're teaching um, software 
development um, on a Linux computer, it's software development on a Linux computer, and that's that's great. Um, where we are, our focus and strength is around um, building electronics, right? So connecting, wiring up and controlling motors, lights, um, you know, different sensors, right? So that that type of side of the world, right? So when it gets into the physical interactions. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's that's where we tend to um, shine and specialize. Mm -hmm. uh, like for for my workshops, I use Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. So we just bring a Chromebook, and then all of our development tools are hosted off of the board. The boards run web servers. Um, web servers are actually much more lightweight than than web browsers, right? Mm -hmm. um, the the server just needs to be able to share documents, do the the physical interactions. Um, so we can run web servers very quickly, um, and then the, the Chromebooks, you know, run their browsers. Um, we have the development environment entirely over a, a, a cloud. This thing called Cloud9 IDE. We don't use cloud servers. The server is on the board. Mm -hmm. uh, boards run Node.js, and they run they, they serve up Cloud9 IDE, and you get to the Linux command prompt, and you can have a nice interactive environment there. I'm happy to send you some boards if you want to just play. Um, and and that's and then you know we get into our library of examples and say, okay, well, how do I talk? How do I turn a motor? How do I read a, a GPIO? How do I? Um, one of the things we have analog to digital converters on our boards. All of our boards have A to D converters, um, mm -hmm. so we can actually read physical analog values. Yeah, because uh, right. Right now, for example, we're using the very b basic system of RepRap, Arduino, Mega, Pololu, Shield. I mean, that, that stuff for 3D printers. So we've got stepper drivers that we plug in. We can also use external stepper drivers. Uh, is there a case for going, for doing an advanced controller with BeagleBone? Yeah, if you want to do higher performance stuff. But we're trying to say, okay, here's the basic minimum hardware you need to even control a laser cutter in a simple way. And right. just push the limits of the simple rep Arduino megas, you know, for it's, control. It's, it's hard to say. Um, so, like, um, like some of the um, so, so the something like machine kit is the way somebody would like like one way somebody might build a three D printer out of a beagle bone, and you know you start with this environment and you, there's a there's a what they call the HAL layer or hardware abstraction layer. So you write little Python snippets um, to essentially map, um, you, know, you know, map geometry to stepper motors. Um, so you know you have um, you have your your G code right, which kind of describes movement within the, the, the physical world of calling X, Y, and Z axes, right? Mm -hmm. You have you know, you've got all these M commands or whatever, but but you've got just like go to this point, yep. go to this point this fast, go to this point that fast, and um, something like Machine Kit allows you to translate that into different geometries. So you can have like um, like in RepRap world, you can have core X Y systems or um, you know different um, very different geometries and deal with those and still work within the same software framework um, and not have to you don't really deal with things so much at the firmware level right you deal with things at the um, system and framework abstractions mm -hmm. um, yep. and that's that's good for some types of learning and, and bad for some types of learning right because uh, I, I, I still love teaching people with something like Arduino or I understand Digital read, digital write, right? You know, mm. twit bit, yeah. And, and that sort of very precise control, and you can still do that um, with the beagles. But you find um, more often than not, people have more full level integration of um, you know how they how they utilize um, the real time controls, right? So. Like not many people actually write the we call them pure use or these these microcontrollers. Not many people actually write the firmware the pure use. It's usually something done by a small group of people, and then they provide an entire Linux distro um, on top of it. So yeah, 
like machine kit or you'll have something like a uh, leadscape is one um or not leadscape uh this <laughs> falcon christmas player is this really cool one because you can do um um all these complex led lighting so like you but you go through a web interface and you define where the different LEDs are, are connected up um, to the board. And then you just stream, like it handles streaming the protocol. So you run a tool called X lights to do like how the lights map onto your house and translate that into um, the light show that you wanna um, put on. And then you download the sequence to the board and it plays back this sequence of you know very complex, you know music aligned with lighting, you know uh, sort of effects, right? So we see people leveraging them in that way. Or Bella is one of my absolute favorite examples, especially for teaching to younger folks. Mm -hmm. uh, Bella.io um, is out of um, you know, Queen Mary University in in London, mm -hmm. and and they use the the, the real time capabilities to create real-time audio. Um, so you can make a, a music synthesizer where from physical events, like a, maybe a push button, maybe an accelerometer, maybe, um, you know, a, a, P, a piezo. And um, looks like we're going into the next meeting. So they can, they can it's half a millisecond to synthesize audio output. And they have a nice web GUI for, um, you know, creating the, the, the sounds and then experimenting and they interface with things like Super Collider and Pure Data, right? So the Beagle world is, it, it's, you know, both simple and complex, you know, at the same time, right? Because people- Is that, sorry, is that Ella Durham? Ella.io took me to elladurham.com. Uh, B E L A. Okay, B E L A, sorry. Okay. Yep. So you said you have to go to another meeting? No, it looks like somebody else joined in this one. No, I don't know. I don't know who that is. Um, yeah, so maybe, um, so you would say that one, well, let's see. You, you talked about the Android, former version of Android, but but that kind of comes with like security issues, doesn't it? Or uh, You know, there's there's continued patches on the, um, the Android open source, but I mean, it's always a possibility that, that um, you know, things fall in disrepair when you, you know, and get into a, a bit rot state when you start dealing with old versions of things. So, so it seems like a missing link is whether it's BeagleBone or uh, Raspberry, a ver well, an optimized, simplified system that does just like okay, web and a couple other things. If, if, because if that's all, if that's what you want, is just a computer to do web browsing. A, a Pi is honestly a better fit. Is it like, wh why is it better? The performance specs of the microprocessor? The, the, the performance specs of the microprocessor and the, the dollar amount and the amount of customization that's been done around it. But that, but that sort of focus, right? Being a desktop computer um, replacement, right? I mean, that's just been, um, I mean, uh, we, we early on, like we started down that direction, but they, they beat us to the punch, right? In a sense that, I mean, they came later um, they've just done a much better job at marketing and, and it's sort of, you know, I just have to concede that to them, right? Um, you know, where, um, like kind of the gap that they haven't filled um, and where we're still very strong is when it comes to interfacing with electronics. If you're not focusing on like the, the external physical computing side, um, then, um, there's still something to say in terms of continuity, open source, yeah, yeah that is right, uh, quality of manufacturing, um, but I, I don't find those being big winners in education. I see those being winners in commercial applications. Yeah, but ultimately in education, um, you know, people tend to be a little bit more um, 
narrow or short sighted. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's hard to um, because you don't like like you're you're kind of crippling yourself with slower performance, and it's like you get um, and and nobody wants to have you know frustrations, uh, you know, frustrated kids because it's too slow. They use they use their the think that. It especially it depends on who you're targeting, right? That's why I say the performance matters so much. Because what they have is that cheap little Android tablet that they, they play with, and like, you know, what are you doing in this in the class, right? What are you doing as you're you're trying to teach? Just if you what you want is a cheap Android tablet, just use a cheap Android tablet. Yeah, I want to go at the market for that aims at the lifetime design thing. Like person like me, like I, I just hate you know buying a little uh whatever cell phone i mean i'm on the bar here your leg. yeah and like it's cracks cracked screen after six months no i want to repair it i want to use it forever right so and and that's why if you focus like like some of the other like if if you're building a a, a tablet right you can sort of replace like if you have a screen that has an hdmi input mm-hmm. you can have any sort of like if it's a touch grade with yeah. hdmi and yeah. usb any computer can be the base for that, right? It doesn't need. It could be a Beagle. It can be a Pi. Um, you know, don't make it dependent on one, right? Just, just use a generic. Okay, I've got HDMI. I've got a standard interface. I've got a USB touchscreen. That's a standard interface, right? Anywhere you can get to a standard interface, that's the way to go every time. Um, get okay. to something where you have some 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 potential. Now. Behind that, you know, can I replace the panel, right? I mean, I love some of the stuff that the open, the one laptop for child folks did. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to fit in their form factor, right? Mm-hmm. But they, um, you know, they certainly thought about a lot about the repair mm-hmm. process um, and um, you know, making serviceable, testable product devices. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but ultimately you end up with things like 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 panels like panels are cheap when they're made in mass volumes so you just kind of have to yeah leverage something that's in high volume yeah so if you you mentioned the route of okay here's a just replace the the pie with a beagle bone so um how much work does that require like so you got the baseboard like how much how many different if kinda... if, if it's hdmi and usb it doesn't take any work I mean, it's just it's just plug in the HDMI cable, plug in the USB cable. Like I use a right. Raspad, I use a Raspad all the time, right? With it's got a, a battery or? with BeagleBone. Hmm. It's got a little Bluetooth dongle. It's got a battery. It's got a, a, a an LCD. Um, oh, actually, okay, that's a great hint because then we can think about okay, when when we are building this, we make sure that we just add another requirement. It's replaceable with BeagleBone. And that way we can remain true to open source. Exactly. And I mean, <laughs> be, you know, support an Odroid, support a, a, a Beagle, support a Pi. Just don't make it tied to a Pi okay. completely. Huh. Are you getting cloned by anybody? We are. Um, <laughs> we had a, uh, for, for a while we got some a lot of clones showing up on eBay as people were using our boards for Bitcoin mining. Mm. Um, and so people were cloning the boards and, um, and then they dumped them on, on eBay as Beagle bones um, when they were done with their Bitcoin mine process. So that was a little bit of a, of a headache. Most of the time clones don't show themselves up as um, like, they don't try to advertise themselves as Beagles. These guys did. These guys did. Yeah, They're, they were trying to. They they showed up on eBay and they said, "Hey, you know, buy these beagles." And you know, they were just. I mean, they were they were from this uh, this bit, Bitcoin mine stuff that was going on. Mm. Um. So we we've had we we authorize um, some clones. Uh, so we have ones that will pay a royalty and for use of the logo to say that they're compatible. Mm-hmm. Um, so Seed makes one, um, mm-hmm. uh, SandCloud, um, there's a, a few others. Um, there was a Russian licensed one um, that did a, a, a module. 
Um, so we, we've, we've had a number of those that are authorized clones. Um, a lot of times for TI custom products, so they'll send in boards for um, review before they go into production. They'll do them, send them in to TI for review. Um, a large proportion of those, like 80% plus um, of the designs using the, that same processor come in and they're very, they, they've taken the BeagleBone design and modified it for their purpose. Yeah. Um, and that includes everything from point of sale tablets. Um, actually, you've probably, um, um, you've probably been to a store that had a, um, a <laughs> something that was derived from a, from a beagle bone. Mm -hmm. Um, if you've gone to one of those little signature tablets, mm -hmm. um, you know, from, you know, these V something or other a phone or, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, um, a, a couple, some of the big guys, um, even in, in Brazil, people, they, they did a burn that they cloned it for, um, ATM machines. <laughs> mm. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of clones out there. Um, probably, uh, 10 times as many clones as there are beagles. Do you guys like that? I do. Yeah. I like that a lot. I wish that we find better ways to kind of get them to pay back to the community. Um, but, um, it's not worth viral licensing in my opinion. Uh, like I don't want to prevent commerce and, and, you know, it, it's, it's very satisfying to me, right. Um, that people are actually building products. Um, oh, you don't have viral license. So you just got like CC. Don't. We have CCB, uh, we have CC. Um, we do have a buy, a BY, but that's only if you republish the design materials. So if you don't publish them you're no you're no way um required to provide attribution or share alike we do have we do b uh, we do bysa so they are required to share alike but if they don't publish them there's there's nothing right it's only if they publish them online do they have to provide the the attribution to share alike yeah so if they just go and make a custom board if they don't share the design materials they don't have to provide any attribution or um you know share alike Wait, I thought you said you're you're because it was bi bysa that's virals, but you said you don't have the viral but it's, clause. Uh, yeah, well, it, um, so our viral clause doesn't uh, it only impacts the design materials, not the manufacturing. So, um, so like you can be a little bit more um, like if you look at GPL v three, mm -hmm. um, like versus GPL v two, um, right? With with v two, um, you have a publishing requirement. Um, the, and that's the difference, right? So we don't have any publishing requirements. Um, um, and with, um, you know, with like GPLv3, in addition to having a, a, um, a publishing requirement, there is a, um, um, a, a no locking out requirement, right? So we don't have either of those. So there's like, we use GPLv2 code um, so if they ship that product to somebody, they do have a sharing requirement. They, if, if you ship a product to somebody and say, you know, here's your, your, your product that uses Linux on it, they are required to provide the, a copy of the source code. Um, but if it's just using our Linux kernel, then big deal. It's already public. They don't have to share anything new. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and it's, it has no impact on the user space or their application code. So they're not required to share those things, um, um, and they can potentially lock it down. There's a there's a term in the industry called TiVoization. Mm, what is that? Have you ever heard of that? So TiVo um, ships the Linux kernel um, on um, their their boxes, but they signed the kernel, so that there's no way to replace the kernel with um, uh, with your own and and you'll find and also this sort of holds true on many Android phones it's very hard you could root them but it's very hard to go and replace the kernel so even though there's a sharing clause that says you have to share the the source code back um, you know there's no requirement that it be upstreamed or that it be um, actually replaceable on the hardware um, yeah, whereas GPLv3, hmm. GPLv3 kind of plugs the um, 
the Tebowization clause, right? So the the workaround, right? So they don't allow you to ship GPLv3 software if there's no ability to actually change the software on the device. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to be able to replace it. So it closes that the the loophole that that gets called Tebowization. Mm -hmm. Um, because they're the first ones to kind of like make a big, um, you know, case about it that, um, like there's no way to replace the Linux kernel on a TiVo, even though it's running Linux. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we don't, we don't have any, that sort of viral stuff, right? So yes, our design materials are CCBYSA. So there's a share alike clause and a attribution clause, um, but that only applies is if they publish the design materials. If they build a board and they put it in a production, there's 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 nothing limiting uh, saying that they have to publish. We don't have a publishing clause, and we don't have a um, you know a share like a uh, that they have to make their hardware hackable, right? That that's not a those neither one of those are requirements. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so back to some of this. Regarding the Steam Camp, um, would you be able to suggest any, do you know any other people that have knowledge in, in the different things? So it's, uh, I assume you looked at the, looked at the curriculum, but between three... I haven't actually, I haven't looked at the curriculum yet. Okay. Is that something you shared in the link? I did. Um, here, let me just uh, point you to it real quick because maybe you can point... Can you access this link or not really? Because I put it in the chat box. Um, I put it in the chat chat box. But the Let's curriculum... See. Not clickable. Okay. Um, the Steam Camp is, is like... The idea there is to create a really powerful experience where you, you're like, wow, I can do this with very basic things. So universal controllers are kind of a universal motion system based on... Uh, we call it the universal axis, which allows you to build a 3D printer, a very simple one, three axis. Then we make a circuit plotter out of it in a simple mill where we actually make the 3D printed motor, electric motor. We make our Arduino. You Uno. make a motor? Yeah. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. This is all, this is why I'm trying to get the team. Like a, like a DC motor or? It's a, a... it's a brushless DC motor, pancake axial flux motor it looks like pancakes so you stack things it's a layer of magnets flat magnets and a layer of coils um, on, um but it's but it's not a stepper you didn't do it in stepper can you, you did a simple no uh can you can you see my screen if i share yes okay so there uh let's see so under curriculum i have all these links on the curriculum page at the very bottom but there's a page called called 3d printed electric motor and it's this humble, humble thing here. That's that's what it looks like. But if you look at the very bottom of this page, this thing is pretty powerful. Uh, it, it's running this propeller. It's 500 watts. This is all open source. You can 3D print a lot of it. So we basically want to recreate that in the form of a smaller for the cordless for a cordless DIY open source 3D printed cordless drill and larger for electric vehicles. But everything is scalable, stuff like that. But you can look at all these links there. So we make that, we make a little battery pack out of 18650 cells, and putting, if there's 12 people participating, we, put, we stack all of those batteries together to make a cordless welder, once again using the same universal controller. So kind of like have this whole crazy ecology of many, many things you can do using a very small tool set that's fully open source, and we, we teach you how to do FreeCAD, KeyCAD, and as much as we can pack in those four days with a lot of library parts and prepared materials and kits uh, and then we go into five project days but basically for this um, for this kind of stuff well the project days that's where the Raspberry Pi tablet vacuum robot and aerial drone were like the three key projects we we're gonna start with I was gonna ask if you know any people like for example the the motor I'm still trying to get that guy um, who did that motor to work with us I haven't caught him yet but I did catch a guy who made a manned the, actually, the first guys that made the first manned multi rotor, uh, so that guy from Germany. So I'm trying to get him to teach about motors. So I'm trying to put together a team of powerful people that can produce the best curriculum, and we all go about creating it together. And it's all open source, and then we pay people to run these camps. 
uh, the, the structures that we're trying to collect right now. So my question to you was, uh, do you know any other people that may be uh, in a space here that would be interested in uh, being instructors? I see your time is limited. Can help us maybe by suggestions because we're like actually looking for people who have the nine days to run this, get paid between like four, five, and eight k, and hopefully use that to fund a lifestyle of open source product development. That's that's our goal to train a lot of people that can be liberated to do open hardware. Because one of the biggest challenges for us is uh, the fact that yeah, uh, continuity. It's it's a persistent challenge. Yeah, I think there's, um, I mean, there's quite a few people in our hacker space that I think would have some of the, the, the knowledge base behind this. But, um, you know, the, um, you know, my network, I think, extends, you know, you know, quite a bit beyond that. Um, the, um, there's an open ag group, um, an open agriculture group at MIT. Um, they've recently migrated from Raspberry Pi to Beagle Bones. Um, farm, are you talking about farm hack people? The farm hack, I don't know. It's open ag. Open ag, it's, okay. It's, they, they produce the, 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 what's it, they call it the food computer, I think? The food pewter, or what do they oh. call that thing? Um, it Basically, it's just a, you know, a, a gantry, like a, like a, you know, just another, yet another um, a three axis gantry um, like a 3d printer um but they're um doing are you talking about the aquaponic guys it's not aquaponic it's a it's personal a food computer. computer okay i see it personal yeah. food computer of the open ag group um, uh -huh. so they just released their design for the their open open ag, ag computer uh and they've replaced the controller in it with a beagle bone uh, are they really open source or are they fake open source there? Uh, they believe they're open source. They, they, I don't know what limitations, like if there's, I, I thought they tend to use easily sourceable materials, but. Well, um, I'm looking at like, if, is it an NC license or are they really open source? You, I have not spent enough time digging into it. They're certainly, their intention is to get other people to build these computers for themselves. I mean, food computers. Huh. Um, I've not built one, so. What's I, it do? It prints in food materials? No, no, no. It, it grows plants. It monitors and grows plants. Oh, like in planting them and... Yes, like seed. I think it's nice. I, yeah, so it's like watering. Um, I think uh, dealing with any sort of uh, weeds and um, like it's whatever the maintenance is that is required to do on the the plants. Right, it has a gantry that it, it uses um, environmental monitoring. Um, you know, for to help with the watering and um, I don't, I don't, I don't know enough about ecology or or food science to know what it really does um you know I, i've only engaged with them on um you know sort of supply chain and information questions uh who's the person there Do you, who's your contact there i i i'd follow up but i'd have to pull up email for it that's interesting because actually by the way Okay, looks like looks like it's for real. CC by 4.0. Okay, because um, actually the universal axis that we have, the universal robotics construction set. Yeah, this is. I mean, I've thought about this. I I'm glad these guys are doing it. If they they actually have this already, then we don't need to do it. Because we have an aquaponic greenhouse here too. Um, it's actually pretty state of art. I think it's the best thing in the world that exists. Uh, let me send you a follow up to that. I, I can send you a link if you're interested in that. But yeah, we're definitely in that space too. So yes, we have thought about, yes, the robot that plants the plants and drones that would actually take it into the it's vertical towers that are watered by fish water from below. So it's using the full vertical space of the of the structure. But it would I, be I great. Another, I sent you another link. The, the, the first um, Linux, my battery's running low now. The first Linux autopilot was actually done on our boards. Okay. 
like the first full Linux open source, like fully open source autopilot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was was done as a joint effort between us and um, uh, DIY Drones. Yeah. Um, yeah. And partially sponsored as a Google Summer of Code project. Was that um, RG Pilot? RG Pilot. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, so RG Pilot has native support for our boards. Yeah. Um, so they, they make some use of the real time components um, on on our boards. Um, and we've continued to stay engaged with the RG Pilot and PX4 um, teams. Um, so, I mean, like doing drones. I, 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 I talk about people generally using these things at higher level of abstractions, right? I mean, they just. They run RG Pilot on our boards, and they have microcontroller firmware and like a whole Linux distro kind of set up um, in order to um, you know produce a solution. And people tend to program like they program it in Python, um, you know, using um, ROS mm -hmm. and and communicating through Mavlink uh, to the autopilot, right? So they would essentially give GPS waypoints to the autopilot and tell it to go there. Um, or whatever other you know, kind of you know, navigation mechanisms that they would have, right? So um, their logic tends to sit, uh, you know, um, above the autopilot layer, right? And they're just running on the same computer, the BeagleBone, as the autopilot. Um, and like so, people doing like a, a fire um, uh, detection, right? So like one of the cool ones was. Um, you know, a Python script that would have it scan over uh, an area with an air quality sensor um, and then, you know, just sampling the air quality and then would go back and hover over, um, you know, the hot spot of the fire essentially with the worst air quality. Mm -hmm. um, and it would tend to track that so that you could throw a drone, you know, launch a drone and it will go to the kind of the, the you know, the, the, the worst point in the fire. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um and that's and that's you know, that tends to be how people, you know, utilize our, our, our boards, right? So they, they, they tend to do those kind of more full stack integrations, which makes it a little bit harder to build the understanding sometimes for as an entry point. Um, because there's a lot to understand. There's many layers to the onion, unfortunately. Um where we've been trying to we've been working with the Linux Foundation um to try to build up some more fundamental trainings around Linux and just like sensor integration, like just, just talking to things at low levels. Um, so there's the EL course, I'll put that in the, in the chat notes. Um, and that's the, so the, the Linux Foundation actually uses our boards in all of their um, professional Linux training. Yeah. yeah, they have Lin they have um, you know Linux uh, embedded Linux curriculum. They have textbooks that are written around our boards. Um, we have we have um, you know there's probably seventy five b books written about using BeagleBone. Um, you know different college text uh, texts on control systems or just like uh, you know IoT and integration, um, but. Uh, um, like, so we, we've done, we do pretty well at the university and the capstone um, level, um, mm -hmm. but we're, we're doing what we can to try to bring that down to uh, more introductory to STEAM uh, levels. Yeah, yeah. Um, we don't want to sacrifice the high ceilings in order to get the low floors, if you know what I mean. Yeah. We don't want to sacrifice where you can go with it in order to try to onboard people. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. So, any thoughts on, um, like, trying to find some other people to on the on the yeah, Steam camp? I, what I, so I mentioned the me? Open Act folks because I think that there would probably be some some overlap in the community. You know, I think that we, I, I don't know what your qualifications end up being to kind of rule people in or rule people out, but certainly, um, you know, getting some attention of, of volunteers based on your curriculum. I think would be fairly easy um, utilizing some of the different uh, uh, collaboration groups in the United States. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Open Act definitely sounds good. Mm-hmm. 
what's the best way to to catch you on the email or is that good or? Uh, uh, chat honestly the chat apps is the easiest way to catch me or text messages certainly send me an email but if you expect like for anything long form send me an email but if you need a timely response um, either text message uh, a call um, we can keep calls very short uh, but those sort of things are gonna definitely help me I get a lot of email mm -hmm. and you sent yeah, you, you sent your your phone your cell on the yeah okay excellent excellent yeah yeah and whatever chat you use I'm sure I'm on it so what if you have any IRC or um, um, Slack or Riot or any any chat applications, Skype or and this you know whatever you have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. If I I'll post it on uh, on Twitter, can you retweet or maybe can I send you a message for like I can can you do something like maybe post a little thing like we're looking for Steam Camp instructors on this or sure. yeah something like that you want to do a guest blog you can do a guest blog on our blog that'd be fine uh blo the beagle bomb blog yeah. let me see that uh, beagle. that'd be cool um if we want to if if this thing's cool enough we can um maybe do something on the adafruit blog Do you write for them, or? I have, yeah. Drew does. Do you know Drew Fustini? Yeah, from, I think I ran into him, from Osh Park? Yes. Yeah. He's what, He's also one of our board members. He's a um, one of our directors, so. Okay. And he does contract work for Adafruit as well, so. Um, I don't know if he has blog access. I have blog access on Adafruit. Um, we can get attention. We just need a good, a good, simple call to action. Okay. The Happy Day folks are really friendly as well. And Hack, Hackaday and Hackster. Who's the contact for Hackaday if I wanted to engage them in publishing about this? You just have to get one of the guys that writes for them interested. Um, I don't know if this is Mike Mike Suzuki or uh, Brian Benchoff, um, Sophie Kravitz. Sophie might be a good yeah. Good Sophie, one I have contact with her. Okay, she still Sophie. works there. I thought she she doesn't work there anymore, does she? I don't I don't know that she works there, but either There's way, she can. She has good relationships there. Okay, I'm yeah, sure I could probably get to to her. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you know the people at Hackster? Hackster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the one that you want to talk about it is Alex. So, Alex Glow. Alex Glow, Glow. Mm -hmm. Okay. But they, they, they'll tend to promo our stuff if we do a project. So the easy thing to do is to do a project entry uh, that kind of gives them a write-up. Um, also at Hackster, Alistair Allen, uh, he's one of their contract writers, um, some of the more popular pieces for is Alistair Allen. Okay. And if we can, if there's any way we can talk about doing stuff together, I think that also gives it some, some weight, so. Yeah. And regarding... Just gotta figure out what we're doing together. Oh. What do you think that could be? Do you have an idea? I mean, so so that we talked about the the tablet thing, um, but is there any like what what's interesting to you? Like what what can you think of anything? For you, it's for me. It's like okay, if you can help us do an awesome BBB tablet, you know, that'd be great. That'd be <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I'd rather do I'd rather do the machine control. <laughs> yeah. For machine control, the thing that we definitely have on the plate is if you. <laughs> If we can collaborate on a drone that can, with vision, 
related to the open ag. So we're actually going to the towers and planting. That is cool. Do so we have a we have a neural net accelerator? I don't know if you're doing any artificial intelligence based vision or um, we'd like to get into that. We're not there yet. Yeah, so that would be a good place because our um, like if we need to accelerate any um, um, like uh, autopilot plus um, yeah vision. Yeah. Right. And neural net based uh, um, object recognition. Uh, that's a place that we would. Um, Let's do it. Uh, we, we could do a lot better than something like a pie. Okay, well, that's. I mean, I've been talking about this forever. Um, how do I find out more about it? Uh, Beagleboard.org slash AI is currently a, there's a very tiny preview, but um, you'll find out about it in a, in, um, a couple weeks. Mm hmm. Um, right, and um, is there any, so you, are you behind that aspect or is there someone else or? Uh, which part the of it? Auto, autopilot plus vision plus neural net object recognition. We would just work with the um, respective communities providing them with support. So uh, like we've got little, it's like we we'll have different pieces of the technology, but it's in terms of like integration. Can you hold one moment? Yeah. Sorry, they were very persistent. Yeah. Um, they, called, they were calling me three times in a row, and um, anyway, so yeah. I decided to get um, Okay, so tell me more about this. So the integration part, yes. Uh, so autopilot, we can run autopilot. Are there autopilot with vision applicate, like that we can just replicate on B BBB? Uh, so, there, so there's so many different layers to this, yeah. but there's... Um, there are different, uh, like, they're, they're different out of ROS, the ROS project. There's yeah. different SAM components that you can take. Um, I think that, um, like, there, I mean, there's there's different things. So we, 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 we would train a model to locate something. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one sort of portion of it, which is just, um, you know, training the model. Then the other thing is... Um, uh, there are a number of different algorithms that you can sort of apply on top of an idle pilot to essentially uh, tell it that you want to have an object um, um, essentially take up a certain percentage of volume in the camera, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it just and that's kind of how you kind of drive positioning, um, but essentially put a control loop around. Um, you know, moving to a certain X Y based on something that's seen, but it just it just depends more on your on your on your logic, right? There's 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 a few different aspects to the framework. One is just an autopilot with ROS um, that uh, the interface is up through Mavlink, and then there's um, you know kind of different levels of SLAM that you can do or si simultaneous location and mapping. Um, yeah, definitely on the two far ends. Right, it is a trained model to recognize something and mm -hmm. to give it location and, and bounding box. Um, and on the other end, it's a control system that tells um, you know the, the drone to go to 
like you know almost like your g-code thing mm -hmm. right where you want to go to a position and and you essentially got a little bit of sensor fusion going on in order to try to build up the control system because you might you'd likely have some type of sort of downward facing sensor mm -hmm. um, to tell it distance from the ground um, in conjunction with the GPS um, or whatever other sensors you might be um, adding to it. So RG Pilot has some degree of sensor fusion that it will use to um, generate at the control loops. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you just have to build kind of your your logic around the, you know, yeah, tell it. Tell the drone to move where this object is this much in the frame, and then tell it to do something else. To do a Would you recommend RG Pilot? As What's the, that? Would you recommend RG Pilot as the? I do. I think to me it's got the best community around it. Um, there's a little bit more of a professional developer community, maybe around PX4, mm -hmm. um, but, but the hobbyist community around RG Pilot makes it most attractive to me. Okay. So, has anyone demonstrated a project where they're doing RG Pilot, ROS, Navlink, image recognition? Yes, um, but not on our platform. On which our one? stuff is too new. Uh, they, they've done mostly on on x86 computers. They do it like a, like it's mostly been demonstrated on on. Uh, I think the the. Is it the up? I'm trying to remember what I saw. Oh, the Qualcomm stuff. There's definitely been some stuff on the, the Qualcomm um, platforms that have demonstrated that. Mm -hmm. And like once the Beagleborn AI comes in, how mm -hmm. long do you think before this application becomes available? Such an application? Uh, you know, I think, I think um, yeah, it depends on uh, um, how, to, how how we excited about it. I would think within six months you would have um, some fairly stable um, uh, system software that, that sits around that, that general application. Is there an advantage there? Like, okay, with BBBAI or BBAI compared to the, say, Qualcomm computers, we get the advantage that we have more documentation on the hardware? Absolutely, Is... and, and people can actually get support. The... the um, the trying to engage Qualcomm mm. on support is a non-starter. They just okay. don't talk to people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this yeah. could be so with Be Beagleborn AI, that could be a major move forward towards uh, AI and computer vision applications like this for the open source community. Yes, I think so. That's good. Is uh, is Raspberry Pi playing in this field too? Uh, you know, they've already had a number of application um, spaces within the field, even though it's not something that they've been specifically targeting. Mm -hmm. uh, but the performance is a little um, a little anemic compared to something like the BeagleBone AI or the Jetson uh, Nano. Um, but the I'd say the you know the oh, my phone's about to die. Okay. The the where um, like people are using the Pi right now and being successful is when they add the Coral TPU to it. Um, so you have to take the, the Google Coral um, accelerator mm -hmm. and attach it as a peripheral to the Raspberry Pi. Uh-huh. What's the price going to be for the a BeagleBone AI? About a, about $100 US. Ooh. So that's lower cost than these other options there. Once you add the accelerator, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Maybe that, yeah, maybe we can work on it. I mean, yeah, I've been talking about this kind of stuff, but it's like I, I was kind of reluctant to get in there because I was, wasn't seeing a clear path in. Um, but this might be it because, yeah, if this is BeagleBone all open source, that's an, an added incentive for me. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Let's see where it goes. I should get, I should get going. Okay. Um, okay. This is a big conversation. I think we touched on a lot of different areas. Okay. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. You, you guys are awesome. Um, so keep going, and we'll keep in touch. Okay.
All right. Oh yeah, see my TED talk. See my first link. You gotta see it. It's four. It's only four I'll minutes. Watch it. Four minutes. Okay. I'll watch it. Okay. Okay, Jason. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye.